I guess we'll get going. There may be a few other people joining us, but I wanted to say good afternoon. Welcome to the very first Arts Chats. Uh, I'm Claire Hopkinson. I'm the Director and CEO of Toronto Arts Council and Toronto Arts Foundation, and I'm really pleased to have you join us in this new discussion series that centers the voices of artists and arts workers. You know, as part of uh, Toronto Arts Foundation's ongoing research into the importance of the arts in city and community building, these arts chats will bring together a diverse array of speakers from a variety of disciplines throughout the month of March. Together, the artists will discuss timely and understudied issues that affect them, their practice, and the impact that their work has on audiences, consumers, and communities. Collectively, these discussions will help guide the foundation's research strategy towards supporting advocacy, programming, and community building efforts across Toronto and, you know, throughout the arts sector as a whole. Toronto Arts Foundation acknowledges the diversity of the First Peoples of this area and recognizes the territories of the Wendat, the Ashinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island and around the world, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work, to live, and to meet on this territory. Now, Arts Chats is made possible and available to you through the generosity of our donors at the Foundation. We are very grateful for their ongoing support of our work, and we invite you all to be part of our programs. After this session, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to a feedback survey, as well as information on how you can be part of and you can contribute to our ongoing community-based work and our suite of COVID-19 response effort initiatives. These initiatives are really helping artists and arts organizations with mitigation, resilience and recovery during the pandemic, and of course includes today's arts chats. In today's discussion, shifting to digital obscuring equity, our panelists will discuss how the arts sector focuses its efforts on the massive shift of virtual modes of creation and delivery, and the ways that this has affected long-standing issues of equity. Leading this discussion is the brilliant Ravi Jane, the founding artistic director of Why Not Theater. Ravi is a Toronto-based stage director and a multi-award winning artist known for making politically bold and accessible theatrical experiences in both small indie productions and large theaters. He has truly established himself as an artistic leader for his inventive productions, international producing collaborations and innovative producing models, which truly are aimed to better support emerging artists make money for their art. So we're so grateful to you, Ravi, and to also all of our panelists for their insights today. So Ravi, without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, hi, everybody out there in Zoom land. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us on uh, potentially your lunch breaks. Uh, I know uh, Zoom can be exhausting, so uh, thank you all for being here and with us. So today we have uh, four amazing panelists. Before I introduce them, uh, you know, we're gonna just, just to say, we're gonna try to have a conversation and have a free flowing conversation. There won't be a Q and A after. Um, and just to say, you know, it's always weird when people are watching people have a conversation. So we're gonna try to speak in draft. Um, we're gonna try to be as honest uh, and as uh, in this conversation as we can be knowing that we're watched um, and there can be silence, we're all human. And a uh, huge shout out to Marcia, who is our ASL interpreter for today, and Karen, who joined us, who I think they're working out the captioning services. Um, right on. So I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then I'll just kind of give a framework for our conversation, and then we'll just dive in. Um, so I'm going to introduce, and they're going to turn on their cameras when I say their name. It's going to be amazing choreography. Uh, so Daniel Carter, uh, who is a theater artist and arts manager, nice entrance. He is the interim program director at Buddies in Bad Times Theater and the general manager at the Paprika Festival. As an arts manager, Daniel has worked with various companies, including Visual Arts Mississauga, Summerworks, and Theater Direct uh, as, uh, with the WE Festival. 
Daniel has performed with companies such as Buddies in Bad Times, Pandemic, Dopo Lavoro Teatrale, Compass Theater. He was a member of Factory Theater's playwriting program, The Foundry, as well as House and Bodies Playwright Initiative. He sits on the Humber College Advisory Committee and uh, Committee for their Arts Administration and Cultural Management Program. Welcome, Daniel. Our next panelist is Marion Newman, who is Quagil, Quagil, oh, I practice this, I'm, I messed it up. Quagulf. Quagil. Quagil, Stalo, English, Irish, Scottish, mezzo-soprano, uh, Marion Newman. Uh, she's been acclaimed for her roles in Barber, Carmen, and Missing, and was nominated for a Dora Award in Shana Ditith. Recently, she has been working on rising to the expectations of her talented and respected colleagues who continue to give her opportunities to share her voice as a speaker, teacher, facilitator, advisor, and dramaturg for various institutions and arts organizations across Canada. She is a proud co-founder of Amplified Opera, Upcoming appearances include migrations in her debut with the Welsh National Opera. Thank you for being here, our international superstar friend. Um, next is Anissa Tejpar. Is going to jump in. Dora Award, Dora Maver Award winner Anissa Tejpar is a dancer, choreographer, producer, and contributor. She's a graduate of the of Canada's National Ballet School, and she's performed in works by leading choreo choreographers internationally, as well as produced work for Human Body Expression and her commercial entertainment firm, Hit and Run Dance. Currently, she assists Guillaume Coté, Coté Dance, with new creations and chore choreographies and choreographs extensively for film and television. Anissa is on the board of directors for the Canada's National Ballet School and volunteers for Dancing with Parkinson's Canada. She's also trained to become an intimacy choreographer and coordinator for stage and screen. Welcome, Anissa. Thanks so much for being here. And last but not least, Jacqueline Kwa Hyasin, uh, who is the acting manager of inclusion at the Royal Ontario Museum. She oversees the ROM's inclusion and community engagement portfolio, including the ROM Community Access Network program, the ROM in My Backyard program, and the Museum Accessibility. In her role, she works across the museum and with over 100 community partners to break down barriers to access and create and co-create inclusive and welcoming museum experiences. Welcome Jacqueline, thank you so much for all the work you all do. Um, so, so excited to have you all here. Um, I'm gonna just give us a little bit of context and then we'll dive in. So just continuing the multiplicity of introductions, another introduction. Um, awesome, so COVID, brought waves of complicated and seismic shifts to conversations around power and privilege in the arts community. So first wave we could say was about income, income precarity, a second wave of massive racial reckoning, a third wave of disparity of experiences during COVID in relation to that racial reckoning, and a fourth wave we could say of mental health and isolation and waves and waves and waves that we could identify and so many feelings and and primarily it really highlighted inequities. And so from a very early on in the pandemic, there was a quick move from a lot of performing arts institutions and in the community to shift to online. The digital being a place where a lot of institutions in particular sought out some kind of normalcy, a way to engage with audiences and keep programming going. Now, in many places, this digital shift was applauded and it was seen as the future of the performing arts. And in many other ways, this solution actually excluded more people. It exacerbated more inequities. And it has been, it, it, era, people have seen it as a distraction to the real issues of inequities that continue to permeate the field. So today we're gonna to discuss with these four amazing panelists who have introduced, some who are inside institutions, some who are outside of institutions about how they've been impacted this year and have a discussion around, you know, has digital addressed inequities or is it a distraction that amplifies them? Um, so that's our start. So I just wanna start off just by getting us kind of rolling to think about, to or just talk about some of the examples of digital engagements that you have either experienced or run or been part of in this past year. And I'll just kind of open up the floor uh, to folks. 
maybe uh, Daniel, there. I'll pick up the ball, thanks. Um, when we first went into lockdown a year ago in March, we kind of quickly rebounded with like this Instagram live series, Queer Far Wherever You Are. Um, and since then we did probably like two large-ish um, digital sharings, one during our pride season, Queer Pride Inside, and then another in December with um, Teal Live, Taylor Mac. Um, a lot faster than putting up a stage show, but a huge uh, learning curve and knowing how to work a camera, I would say. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Mary, uh, Jacqueline? Um, at the wrong, we, um, we do a lot of programming with community partners, often at the museum. Um, and the shift to digital, I think, has been interesting in that, to your point, Ravi, it alleviates some of the inequities, but it also highlights other inequities. So a uh, couple of programs that we've shifted from the physical space to digital space is a creative writing workshop series with NQL workshops for people with lived experiences of mental health. Um, previously, it, you know, we would take them through the museum and then do creative writing in a classroom. And now we just shifted it all online. Um, I also worked with Youth Rising Above to shift our Discover You program online. That's a youth skills development workshop series that, again, used to be in the museum within the galleries and has now shifted to Zoom. Um, and in a way, it's it's alleviated the inequities of access because it's allowed us to reach a broader audience. You know, we are a museum that serves the whole of Ontario, but the reality is um, because of our physical location, only certain parts of Ontario are able to visit on a regular basis. So putting our content, putting our programs in the digital space um, alleviates that. But it, on the flip side, you know, there are all these other inequities that have to do with digital programming, like te technology glitches, access to the internet, access to good internet, um, the privilege of being able to be in a space where you can fully engage in a program without having to worry about roommates or, or kids, right? So it's all these interlocking things um, that are coming into play and that we're really feeling our way through right now. Thank you for bringing up so many of those uh, uh, issues that come up in this in the shift. Um, Mary and Anissa, I'd love to bring you in to just kind of to share. Yeah, just just spinning off what what Jacqueline said, it's um, as an independent creator and as someone who is in charge of a lot of their own content to start with, um, the shift to digital, I mean, yes. Are you reaching more people? Sure. Are you reaching people you wouldn't reach before? For sure. But to what end and for what, you know, uh, for many of us, it's, um, it's work, it's a job, it's, uh, it's what we do for a living. So, so to, you know, rig up your phone and for me dance in a park to post on Instagram for free, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of labor in the learning of how to do that. I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not a, I'm not a digital content creator. So what do I do? I either put up a not so great product that I'm not intensely proud of because it's not at the level that I uh, would like to showcase my work and myself, or I hire someone with the expertise, but uh, how do I pay them? And, and even if I were to pay them um, and could find funds or funding, am I, um, am I really able to put in this kind of labor and time into learning an entirely new skill when I have, you know, responsibilities as a parent, as a caregiver, as a wife, as all the things, all the hats that we all wear. Um, and how long will that take? You know, everybody, I mean, if, if uh, I think I'm in a large group of people who has grown to hate the word pivot, but if, if we were to pivot, how fast could we pivot? I mean, could it be day to day? I don't have an institution or a, or a, a, a large, um, you know, community of people to support me in this way and they're all busy supporting others or supporting themselves or trying to, to make this happen, uh, this, this pivot to digital. And, and, then I, and then 
you know, I go back to also, is this the way that my skills and my art form is meant to be viewed? Does it land the same? Does it, does it matter as much as it would if we were all sharing space in a room and it happened once and you saw it that one time that that community experience of watching something, the breath of the performer, the breath of the audience, I, in whatever kind of space you're doing it, whether it's in a park or in a proscenium theater, you know, there are, I've been doing programming and many of us have been doing programming in many places, but that live experience is where my experience and talents land. So to then um, be now an Instagram star is, I don't know, or is TikTok or whatever. This? <laughs> That's why I'm in this business. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, not that it's a bad thing. Listen, I'm, I like a like, like just as much as the next guy, but, but yeah, like, I guess I, it poses all these questions of like, what am I actually trying to get out of this? And, and what am I trying to get out of this shift? And how does that service my, my work, my, my bank account, my future life? Like what, what does that equal? And often I come up with not much, but that's, I guess, what the independent person is struggling with, and I mean, I guess I'm I'm speaking for myself, but I think I'm speaking for many as well. That's Marian? awesome. Thank you. That's so <laughs> much great information, and and uh, just to bring Marion in, it makes me think about just in terms of the pivot. You know, Marion, just to share the when the mistakes are also online, and it's like they're there for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I have said yes as a, as an individual artist, and not representing my company um, to various different digital offerings. Uh, that were had pivoted from <laughs> from live performances that were intended. Sorry, had to. <laughs> um, but it's I'm not used to seeing myself in performance, and it's been quite uh, a lesson to realize that I'm not made for film, or at least I'm not made for seeing myself. I should say, <laughs> I prefer not to have that immediate feedback. <laughs> um, but there are also lessons to be learned, which are valuable, which I can take forward into live performance when we can do that again. Um, as a member of AO, I came on um, to the team right as the pandemic began. Um, we had a meeting in April and then I was doing a gig until March when I was back in town and we had meant to start our meetings. And so we had to move to Zoom meetings and suddenly we were getting postponements and, and shutdowns for all of our individual work. And that actually gave us a lot of time to get to know each other and to take it slow and to figure out what is Amplified Opera, what is it exactly that we want to offer and that we benefit from knowing each other a lot better and having communication skills uh, with each other. Uh, so I think just figuring out um, we all knew that there were things about the industry that the opera industry that we don't love um, as well as many things we do and so wanting to do things differently we needed time to figure out what that means and how will that play out when we can be in theaters again so we have and also as for people of color we've all been asked to be on so many different panels to give master classes to to help diversify the what is being offered to to the many and and so we've supported each other in that work in the discussions that we've had with each other and um just done what we can to make space um to download afterward if something was frustrating or to to lift up when when we really needed to hear that that's awesome it's awesome that you guys you took you, you were able to take the time to really develop your own internal relationships and take the time and ask questions and you know i'm curious kind of building on anisa your question like what am i trying to get out of this shift i think something building on that for me i'm really curious about everybody's thoughts um in terms of digital engagement and like was that what we needed to be doing like for me, we had this one moment for the entire arts community, well, okay, the entire world, but then the microcosm of like arts communities across the country and in North America, all trying to get on the same page for like, a, in a real way, real way-ish, uh, and to look and talk about white supremacy and to really engage with these questions and these problems and these systems and these dynamics of privilege. And we saw the inequities and the imbalances and 
you know, I'm curious, did digital allow us to engage and make the shifts that were needed to make those changes? Or was it a way to preserve status quo and pretend like it could all be well? And obviously you all use it for different ways, internal reflection, shifting to go online, to engage your potentially your community who is vulnerable and you need to create a space for them um, to access different communities. Um, so absolutely there's a million things going on, but like, I guess my question is, did digital allow us to, to do the work that needed to be done, especially as artists of color who are constantly asked to fix things? Um, did, you know, did we get what we needed to get out of the shift, knowing it's not over? Um, if I may, I think that what this shift gave us was an opportunity to really take the time to say, what if we told our own stories? What does that look like if we're leading the way? and companies who were struggling with how to, how to um, engage meaningfully with the communities that have been um, not given space traditionally. This was an opportunity for us to say, this is how we would tell our story if we're allowed to lead. And um, like I was invited by Calgary Opera to come in and dramaturg a piece. And I have never been asked that before but I realized that lots of experiences that I've had have led me to a place where I know how to work with community. And so by bringing in the right people, we could build a piece together. And they gave us three weeks in the space and, and some lead up time on Zoom. And we, we've started creating a piece that is basically for us that we can invite the, what's considered the regular audience into but that isn't just tailored for them. It's so that we can tell our own story in our own way. And I think that just being given that opportunity has been um, a chance for us to gain confidence, to realize that when we are asked for our opinion, we really are, we really are allowed to give it. And I, I, that, is the, that is a positive part of this whole thing is just learning to use our voices. Thank you for that. Uh, I totally agree, Marian. Like, I think there has been so many uh, people picking up batons and really running with them. And, and that's, but, but to answer your question, Ravi, I think it's both. I do think also there has been uh, a lot of people just trying to preserve their careers, preserve their organizations, and to not, uh, you know, become dinosaurs, become extinct in this time. Um, and I, there's been a lot of, you know, stuff thrown at the wall and you know, some of it's successful, some of it isn't, but some of it is, I think, just holding on with a really tight grip. Um, but yeah, I like Marion's answer better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I would say it's both, but I think there's also like, I think the pressure to produce is very real. Um, and the sort of consequences of not um, continuously or even like periodically putting things out, putting out products to engage with, you do see a decline in donors and donations and funding support. I mean, right now it's also theater operation grant season and we have to plan something for next year and it's like I don't even know man like when are we when are we coming back who knows so I I, I think it like yes but also kind of being stuck to to continue and ensure that these companies these institutions are programming could exist two, three, five years down the road. Yeah, that's super interesting. Please yeah, go. I uh, completely agree with Daniel. I think uh, you know we see in the news in the news how um, how hard the arts industry and arts organizations have been hit by this pandemic. Um, museums, I think, have it a bit easier than uh, theater companies because uh, we our space allows for more physical distancing. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, there are museums all over the U.S., mostly in the news, who are having to shut down, who are having to sell artworks. And I can't help looking forward to the future and being like, where are, 
where will Canadian museums be headed, right? Because um, because we do rely on these donor dollars, we do rely on these admission fees, these memberships, and everyone right now is struggling. And when people are struggling to put food on the table to pay their rent, you know, um, arts unfortunately um, are one of the one of the things that get set aside. And you know, not saying that's the wrong decision. You need to put food on the table. It's just. <laughs> It's just there are all these, uh, I think that the, the pandemic is making us, making everyone rethink their priorities, whether it's do donation priorities or entertainment priorities or self-care priorities. And what I'm, what I worry about is that the conversation will continue to be like an either or conversation, whether it's a digital converse, digital events versus um, in-person events as if that's a real dichotomy, right? Because because um, it shouldn't be just one or the other. I think the pandemic has proven that the institutions and artists can provide both, that audiences have a hunger for both, for all sorts of reasons. And I worry that down the road, these number crunchers would be like, oh, look, it's so much cheaper to put a production on Zoom than it is to put in the theater. And no, you know, there's so much more that goes into what people need. Yes. That. Oh, please, Marion. I've been hearing that cities are emptying as people go to find places where they can have some green space to be outdoors with some distance where it's not as expensive, perhaps. And it makes me think, uh, I mean, obviously I'm very arts minded, but is it because the art that glues it all together is not available in the same way? Yeah, one of, I mean, outside my role at the ROM, like I love going to theater shows. One of my favorite parts about living in Toronto is being able to just drop by buddies or, you know, or Mervish or, or why not theater, all these other places and just to check out all these cool shows. I think, I still remember the last, the last, right before the pandemic hit, I went to Factory Theater for, I think it's called Lady Sunrise, about the Asian community in Vancouver. And it hurts to think that, you know, I can't do that for the foreseeable future. It's, it sounds kind of dire, but, you know, it, it can feel kind of dire sometimes <laughs> as an arts lover and an arts administrator. Well yeah, well, I mean, Marion, on, on your point, and, and Jacqueline as well, like, I just moved out of the city. Like, I, as an artist, I bought a house in the west of Toronto, which we haven't moved into yet. But, you know, because of these exact reasons, I used to want to be in the center of all things to experience all of the things from, you know, restaurants to theaters to museums to you know being able to be a hop skip and a jump from all the things from all my work and now it doesn't matter as much anymore to me it matters more to me to be in a space that works for my family and I don't hate the reprioritization in my own life and making sure work is work and life is life and not that they're separated but that they maybe aren't the same thing um, but that's a personal choice and the fact that it just made it a lot easier knowing that I wasn't going to have to race the theater anytime soon um which is sad actually um but maybe we'll work out Ooh, life choices but this is great I mean, <laughs> I, it builds for me what kind of the, the question Jacqueline proposed in terms of what people are asking which is how, how do I prioritize and I think that's kind of what I'm thinking about in this conversation with regards to our sector and how do we prioritize you know, we know that the arts living wage is below the poverty line. We know that um, people are color, of color are disproportionately affected uh, in the arts community, black and indigenous in particular. And we know, we know these things are real. And how, how in that, how can we figure out what our priorities are as a community as we're trying to figure out the way forward and, and address like artists like Anissa, who has to leave because Toronto's way too expensive. Um, and I know that's a ton of, of, of there are tons of factors that you've got to juggle, but I guess, 
have we been engaging in that? Have we really been thinking harder about when we come back? You know, Daniel, your, your question was so good. Like you have the sticky notes. I got to plan a season. I got to figure this out. You know, I, you definitely have those real pressures. And at the same time, the pressure of, well, what does it look like when we're back? And who does it look like? And Marion, to your, like, who's leading? Whose voices? Um, who has the money? I mean, that's the, that's the, I think the question that many in the arts don't want to say out loud, Ravi, but that's a question we're all dealing with, right? Recorded. <laughs> well, it's like, I don't know, I feel like in the arts, there's always this whole sense of we're doing it for the love of the arts. We're doing it because we want to share knowledge. And that's true. We do. But there's a reality of, you know, rent has to be paid. Um, the dinosaurs have to be kept cool, right? Like it's uh, money is a reality we're all living with. <laughs> and I think it's important to have this conversation and to bring it out to light, right? Because to your point, Ravi, um, BIPOC artists, disabled artists, deaf artists, um, artists living who grew up in poverty, um, you know, there are all these systemic barriers that have to be addressed and that have to be crushed down. And earlier you asked about, you know, we had this one moment early in the pandemic where we were all looking at white supremacy and trying to fix it. And with all respect, I would challenge that we had that one moment. I think we've had many moments over the last few years, you know, where everyone's like, we're all in this together, you know, we have white, white supremacy, right? <laughs> like, and then something else happens. And then a new issue comes, not issue, sorry, a new subject comes to light. And all of a sudden this first subject has fallen by the wayside. You know, all these institutions, all of these companies came forward and were like, we believe that Black Lives Matter. How many of these companies have Black people in leadership and the board in decision-making roles? Right, and how much longer will this conversation continue before someone's like, you know, well, black lives do matter, but so do these lives, and so does this concern. It's a horrifically constant cycle that I wish I knew how we can break out of. Anyone want to pick up on that? Yeah, Marion, Daniel. Keeping the, the dinosaurs cool, like <laughs> that's gonna keep rolling in my mind. That's amazing. Um, I'm thinking about how to shift. Um, I guess what watching things on digital has taught me is that it's really about the equipment you have at home and not even whether, I mean, yes, definitely. Do you have access to internet for, to begin with, but what speakers do you have on your thing? If you're, used, if you're watching something that is used to being in a, an acoustic space, um, and I think initially there were a lot of thoughts of like, how can we include digital in what we're doing when we get back to being in spaces? Um, but I think now I'm thinking more about how really just letting it be simple and letting it just be what it was um, is something that I'm really craving. And I think it's, that is a gift that's been given to me to realize that we don't have to make it bigger and louder and faster. We just, what we do in an acoustic space as people is already enough. Um, Daniel, I, th I thought you were gonna say something. The chat is blowing up y'all. I'm doing a terrible job of uh, doing that. So if you can talk, I'm gonna be, if I look distracted, I'm scrolling through the chat to try to uplift some voices here. Sure, sure. There, there's kind of two points from Jacqueline, what you said and Marianne as well. Um, like I feel institutions are also under a microscope right now and like we're being watched. Which institution hasn't put out a statement in June and how are we actually going to engage with that statement and manifest it? Um, and so many things has, have happened since June 2020 in institutions with changes in leadership and um, 
redispersing resources, funding into communities, artists of color. Um, but I think one thing to also keep in mind, like when we start opening up again, we're going to be opening up at a different scale. And the real question is going to be like, how are institutions using those resources, both for themselves, but also for artists and outside of their institution? Um, and I think that's really going to be the key moment, I think. Uh, I think the question I'm sort of thinking of is, how has this time allowed institutions, decision makers, to rethink the resources that they have at hand and how are they going to redistribute that? Anyone want to pick up on that? Anise, I'm curious from an independent point of view, what you think about that? Um, it, well, yes, I, uh, I, I don't work for institutions, so I can't speak to that, but... Um, sometimes, I think in a course correction, things become more complicated for a hot minute and we're in that hot minute, right? Um, and we have been before as Jacqueline so well put, like put so well. But I sometimes feel like the pendulum swings at a wild pace and it's not, it's very confusing um, when you are someone who is not only seeking out funding, but also, you know, pursuing um, organizations for partnerships, pursuing um, corporate sponsorship or individual donors or anything like that, which I have the opportunity to do all the time, which is great. Um, but <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not easy to know how it's going to swing and there's really a lot of challenge in figuring out who and what to target and in what and then yes and then your work gets changed because of it because then you're creating work based on what you can fund not based on what you're uh actually pursuing as an artist or your collective is or your organization is because you're just trying to as daniel said so well you're just trying to do something you're just trying to make something you're just trying to be out there. You're trying. There's pressure. There is. Um, yeah, you don't want to get out of the game, and and that is ego and all those other things that we don't like about ourselves. But it's also how do you continue to 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 make when um, when you don't know if you can afford to make it? I mean, I'm saying this very badly and very all over the place, no. but. I think that's bang on. Sorry to cut you off. Please, please. I'm encouraged. No, 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 no. Th thank you for the support, Ravi. I, I just, I, I, I sometimes I'm like, do we make a show about being South Asian? Is that what we're going to do now? Because I feel like that would get funding. And then on the other hand, if I don't make a work about being South Asian, then I'm not um, an ally to my own people. So, you're opening, then, up, you're opening up the other can of worms. Sorry, there. is that you're a big there. one? Sorry. Just like, yeah, here we I go. I know. Here and then go. like, am I, and is it just because I'm a, I, I come from a mixed heritage? Am I then somehow an advocate just by definition? And, and maybe yes, because I'm living the experience. Or maybe no, because I want to make it work about, I don't know, pens and chairs. Like, I don't know. Uh, it's it's so all over the place, but then when it comes to funding, when it comes to getting money, some things work sometimes, and some other things work other times, and you're you're kind of lost no matter what. Sorry, again, I didn't say that super great. Yeah, I'm no, sure somebody good, else. Good. I'm gonna try to sandwich sort of two questions that are coming to mind. Mary, do you have a point? Did you want to say something? I just wanted to say I love that can of worms um, because it reminds me that those of us who are from colonized places, who are colonized people while our own cultures were being removed so we don't actually know as much about them as we ought to, we were being given a language and art that is from another culture, but we can call it our own and we have every right to be performing that if that's what we choose to do. Amen. Thank you for that. 
Um, but wow, we could, I mean, we are at the, we could go in so many different directions right now. Um, I'm just thinking of, okay, okay. But I, I want to come back to the, one of the comments in the chat, digital feudalism is about means and resources and structured control of the same. So kind of building on some ideas around equipment and access and, and this digital sphere, being a kind of place, a, another space, right? Another kind of institution. And I think a question I have building on Daniel's com uh, comment about resource and ISA um, is uh, like, who should lead? Who should be leading this conversation right now? And Marion, you kind of talked about like, you, you found this opportunity that your voice now, you can be authentic and have your voice. And I guess I, the, the two questions I sort of want to pin together here is, is not only who should lead and who should be, where the resources should be to lead the conversation, but also to speak about that from a place of acknowledging as, as it was called into the space earlier about how you all as artists are often put in a position where you have to be an educator and an artist. And so in leading and thinking about resources and getting them to people, how can, who should be leading and being empowered and, and can that leadership and empowerment be artistic as much as it is about education or, 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 or in a way kind of engaging with the tension of what you both were just talking about, identity versus artistic kind of output. I hope that made sense. I see head nods and I throw the ball up. So personal bias informs my answer, I will say, but I think the, the people who should lead the conversation are those who've historically been left out. You know, Marion, you said earlier about all these new opportunities that going digital has made available. And I think if we're going to open new opportunities, if we're going to make space for new forms of engagement, then we should, we should give the space for people who haven't had those opportunities before to step up, right? And that's a very broad spectrum because there are a lot of communities who haven't been given the space before. There are a lot of groups doing great work who don't have as much access to resources because they don't have the audiences, they don't have, you know, they don't have the resources, ironically enough, to get more resources, right? But then you get the flip side of what Anissa and Marion were talking about of, I think, the double-edged sword of authenticity, right? Because then when you're saying we need you know, we want to amplify X, Y, Z voices, then you're putting pressure on people from these communities to stand up and be like, I'm X, Y, Z identities. And is that really where we want to go, right? Like, I've um, seen these conversations on Twitter about the own voices hashtag in books, where people say, you know, this book is own voices because it speaks about their lived experiences. But now people are having to self-identify about their lived experiences when they might not necessarily want to. And like, you know, it's all like and you say you spoke about funders, but even just in terms of self-expression, I feel like there's more of a pressure on people from marginalized communities to be authentic. And what authentic is is such a broad spectrum that it's impossible. I think, to be big A authentic about all your identities. Um, just to share, you're getting shout outs and lots of love for your cat. <laughs> he, he doesn't like being ignored. So <laughs> his name is Scout for all his fans. <laughs> um, does anyone want to pick up on that at all? Yeah, I'm reminded. Um of Yvette Nolan's teaching to me uh, that there's this hierarchy that is a pyramid and if we turn it on its side and round it out it becomes a circle and that if the leadership is made into a circle where we can see each other face to face we have an opportunity for everyone who's in that current hierarchy to actually speak and to share their ideas and their they're valuable assets that they weren't necessarily hired for or haven't been looked to before. Like, I, I think that 
this leadership um, or speaking up that I've been able to do right now is because I'm not busy learning roles and performing them. And that's something I really miss doing. And I've probably been asked to speak a lot before, but just didn't have the capacity to really hear it and to understand that um, my opinion was already being valued. But I think that a lot of what has been holding us back is that pyramid and, and thinking that we have to keep listening to the same bosses who don't necessarily know what our experience is because they've been up there for so long and they haven't thought to see what we have to contribute because that's just not how it's usually been done. And I want to move forward into a space where we can lead differently and where that means hearing from everybody. It means for me also trying to pay everybody equally. So instead of putting like two people at the top of a company who make all the bucks, what if that were shared more equally so that, um, so that everybody can actually afford to keep doing this so that the artists are not valued at the bottom of it all um, according to what a union has you know, decided is a, enough money to make um, a week because of the size of the house. I mean, the work is the same no matter where we're being seen. And honestly, if it's a smaller house, you're being seen more up close. So your work needs to be more precise. Um, uh, flip side of that for an opera singers, you have to be a lot louder if you're in a bigger house. But <laughs> there's just, I think there's a lot of room for re-examining what we are putting our dollars into and how we are valuing those who aren't actually producing the art itself, um, but the ones who are running it all. So like it's become so business minded that we're not hearing from artists of what, you know, how could it be different? I think we, we have a lot of ideas that um, we have not been, uh, we've been afraid to share, I would say, because we might not be hired back if we're too mouthy. <laughs> Let's, let's also remember that as artists and art makers and arts curators and, you know, just everyone in the job, we've all worn a bazillion hats over the years. Everybody has been a part of so many different parts of the, the production, the project, the, the installation, whatever it is, um, that our voices are, are, are informed. We're not, we're not not capable. You know, we're not just the pretty voice on stage or the pretty body on stage or that, you know, it's not just that. None, I don't know one artist that hasn't worn several hats. So if asked a question with the availability to be honest and the, and the potential for change, I think artists can handle the task and can handle it actually with a lot of, um, I don't want to use the word grace because that's the wrong word, but with a lot of like um, strength of character and 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 with a lot of vision i think for what can be different i agree with you marion 100 percent. can i ask like do you think that this digital space because we can't be together and we all need to be engaging like are we are we having more honest conversation are we actually doing that go marion your head's not fast i totally am i I was uh, much more measured, I guess, in, in my approach um, to begin with. And I did a lot more listening because I had a lot to learn. But um, through gathering information from wise people who were speaking up, I'm starting to form my own ideas and to shape them um, in it or shape how I speak about them according to who is easiest to listen to, who draws everyone in. Um, I think that that, that is been a big thing. And I also just wanted, I forgot, but I wanted to say this earlier, is that if you let people of color lead, we're not going to get rid of everyone who has been leading. <laughs> it's just about, Wait, you know, what? sharing that space. We're, you know, we're not going to kick you all out. <laughs> you do still have really valuable skills and input. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree with Marion. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Finish your point, please, please. That's the point. It's true. I mean, you know, um, but it, just in terms of being honest, having more honest conversation, are we feeling like the fear of retribution is not there? Is the power dynamic actually shifting? Are you like, sorry, who was that? Me. I am. Um... I hesitate to say that power dynamic is shifting, but 
the digital space allows for um, more intimacy in some ways. So instead of like, you know, having frank conversations in the hallway where anyone can just drop by, we can have frank conversations in Zoom where, you know, only my cat will be around, right? So there's a certain opportunity to be honest that you that may not have been present when you're speaking in within the institutional space. Uh, the flip side, of course, is that there's also a forced intimacy in that, you know, now so many people are seeing my white wall, <laughs> right? Like, and I, and I don't really have much choice in terms of who I can let into my apartment because because we because all of our meetings are now online and are now from the privacy of my home right so it's both like yeah i can i feel like i can be more open because of where i am but at the same time i feel like i want to be less open because of where i am it's a weird tension um yes yeah. I, I do oh sorry ravi no go ahead go ahead just just it's so quick but just because of the pandemic i also think that um even those people at the you know quote unquote top i think everyone has been shaken a bit just because everything has changed and i think that that has allowed for a bit of more vulnerability um and maybe a little more listening so back to marion's point i do think i'm having more frank conversations with people that i wouldn't be able to have had uh, possibly before because of the go, go, go mode and everybody was succeeding or, you know, whatever. But now because everyone got a bit rocked, everyone's kind of looking around trying to figure out what the best new way could be, especially when we're thinking about not going back into live spaces for a bit and maybe doing this meeting of digital and live at some point or whatever it is, I think people are more likely to hear or listen more, more thoughtfully. Um, I'm just conscious of wrapping up, but there's one comment in here that just kind of ties back to this point around leadership and, and Marion, what you said around, um, you know, wanting to pay people better. And one of the things I think with all of this that, that, that we're, for me has been crucial in all of the different areas of conversation, whether it be uh, mental health, uh, income inequity, racial justice, all of them are really about the health of our community and the, and the awful unhealthy practices that we have. And money is a big part of that. And thinking about how, you know, with this leadership, Anissa, that gets rocked, you know, how do we talk about also capacity for Organize, different organizations that we're often thinking about the capacity of institutions. But when we think of smaller companies where tends to be the diverse leadership, it's hard to retain talent. You know, I'm sure Amplified Opera wants to pay artists the same that the Canadian Opera Company can pay, but your budget is only so much. And how to retain talent, how to actually build um, artists that you invest in um, and how to recognize who's been propping up the community who's been developing talent and how, um, yeah, how does this arts ecology work more holistically and, and think more about um, uh, uh, who's doing the work? And I feel like I've heard that a lot in so many different circles, who's doing the invisible work, whether it's women, whether it's black people, indigenous people, whether it's people, the people who, are um, bear the cost of the labor, as was mentioned on the call, in a lot of instances, um, in order for things to work. And I think that for me is, the, is, is, is kind of an underlying uh, thought, sorry to leave people with, but I'd love you to chime in on, on that, just in terms of this conversation about where, where do we wanna be and, and how do we get there? I don't know if that resonates. It does from a large institutional perspective, because uh, the shift of digital space, I think, has uh, um, shifted opportunities to people who know how to work in the digital space. Whereas if you look at, uh, you know, big institutions, museums, theater companies, uh, there are so many staff uh, who don't 
for in digital space whose very jobs are predicated on being in a physical space, right? And these are often um, where you'll find a lot of BIPOC folks, for example, right? Um, front of line workers, um, ushers, people who welcome people into spaces. And, you know, if we're talking about like priorities because of all of these shifts, it's like how we have to make sure that people in these roles are not left behind as we get all excited about the digital spaces. Well said. Um, I'm going to have to wrap us there. I, I can't thank you all so much. Daniel, Marion, Anissa, Jacqueline, uh, you're all amazing. I hope everybody follows you on Instagram and we turn one of us into some kind of Instagram star. I think that would really make this worth everyone's time. Um, no, the conversation was. Um, I got to just do a little closing on behalf of the Toronto Arts Foundation. Again, huge thank you, not only to our panelists, but also of course to Marcia, our amazing ASL interpreter and Karen, who we didn't get to see from, but she was doing uh, closed captioning. They were doing closed captioning, excuse me. Um, um, uh, thanks to all of you who were uh, with us for the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of Toronto Arts Foundation, thanks to the donors who made this series possible. You know, follow all of our companies as well if you want to. We are also artists and happy to accept a donation. Um, next week's session is What is Success? Impact Measurements and Creative Practice, moderated by the Foundation's Research and Impact Manager, the incredible Sean Newman. This discussion with four new panelists will focus on the strategies that the sector has been using in the last year to understand impact, but also the struggles to understand success in this new environment and how our current context is reshaping conversations about impact. So check that one out. More information about art chats and other foundation initiatives, as well as opportunities to donate to the foundation's work is available online on the website, torontoartsfoundation.org. And I'm sure Buddies in Bad Times, Opera Amplified, The Rom, and Anissa Tejpar's Hit and Run and Why Not Theater are all websites you should go to. All of them must have a donate link. Why the heck not? Uh, beautiful artists, beautiful people. Thank you all so much for uh, this great conversation. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. Everyone's literally ready to go to their next Zoom. So I don't even know why we're still hanging around. Um, <laughs> Thank you all so much. It was really great. And thanks to all of you who are putting stuff in the chat. I couldn't manage it. Uh, it was at capacity, uh, but thanks for participating. All right, y'all, thank you so much. We'll see you, I guess, on email and we'll just kind of debrief, say hi. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Marcia, thank you.